second Friday of June. And we have some really awesome features for you coming up and some exciting announcements. And um, the first thing we should do is determine where is the best place to write? Here. Here. Who are the best people to write? Us. And when is the best time to write? Now. You got it. We'll be doing that again. All right. Um, we will have a change in format for the grand tournament. It's going to be the grand showcase. And we have lots of flyers for that. Um, we are right up here on the north side of all this. Um, so um, instead of being the big annual competition that we have ordinarily done, we decided to change it to the grand showcase, not the grand staircase, the grand showcase. <laughs> and uh, we, there'll be dozens and dozens of different uh, poets featuring in like 10, 20 minute time slots throughout that Friday and Saturday. So you'll get to hear a lot of different people bring out a lot of different types of work and um, some of them I'm sure will be bringing like their best stuff that we're going to compete with anyway. So you can get information about that. We're going to have some like food vendors and like cover art artists and other kinds of cool things that will be available for you to buy or peruse um, when you're here for that. See here, we have over 40 performers, two days, four shows, maybe more. Anyone interested, talk to Azro. Um, we're also going to do the unveiling of the banner at this point. Yes. So Azro has a banner that he's very excited about. Yes. Excited for the banner. And there's Sarda Proline. Oh boy. <laughs> but thank you for being here, Mary. Yes, we're going to do poetry. Uh, mm. What didn't remain was sort of hanging from my arm. I don't remember crying. 
I don't even remember who I told. I probably grabbed my grandmother's bottle of iodine out the medicine cabinet and found a way to stain my entire body red. I'm not sure if I picked at it. I probably did. Because it left a beautiful scar, my most favorite of them all. It's in the shape of a faint heart. I call it my heartburn. Maybe it was the foreshadowing of the thousands of ways I'd wear my heart on my sleeve. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, don't, 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 don't be done now. Okay. And at least 20 minutes. Okay, I'm going to read some poems. So this is from my book. It's called um, Journey to Hold, Excerpts, Essays, and Exhales. It's my first full-length book. I um, was supposed to be, last year I was supposed to be writing the follow-up to that book um, called Journey to Healing. And then I wrote the intro and I was like, yeah, I can do this. I can talk about my path to healing, and then I got to the very first chapter and was like, no, I'm not ready to talk about that yet. <laughs> um, it's, so it's, uh, that one is still a work in progress. I didn't think it would stump me the way it did, but it just reminded me that healing is a very, very fluid and ongoing process, and the things that I thought I was healed from, <laughs> they're quite. Um, so I'm going to read some poems. This one is called A Poem for Langston. I am the darker sister. They parade me on the front lines in awe of hips, ass, and thighs. I walk head high, shoulders back, shaking the earth. Today, my skin is a mark that sunshine has a sense of humor. My nose wide to breathe the wind. My smile, a gift, my hair, a crown besides being black, full, and nappy carries a crown of joy. I, too, am. Pride Month, yay, Woo. Pride Woo. Shout out to all us queer folks out here, however you choose to identify and show up in life. I am personally here for you. Um, I identify as a bisexual woman. Um, I came out, I don't know, a while ago, it was a process. Um, but uh, working for the last almost year for the LGBT Community Center, uh, it just really showed me how invisible bi folks are. So I've been making it my business to say that I'm bisexual and just insert it in random parts of conversation where even where it doesn't belong. <laughs> like my grandma could be like, oh yes, Jesus. I was like, yes, bisexual. Praise <laughs> yeah. the Lord. Praise the Lord, my bisexual black ass. So, um, no, I don't really say that around my grandmother, but, well, my, my ancestral grandmother, she's probably about to pop the hell out of me, but yeah. Um, so I'm gonna read a couple of poems, uh, just, just talk about me being me and about people who I love and admire um, and things like that. So this one is called Dandelions. Yesterday, my niece looked at the grass and saw pretty yellow flowers for the picking. I told her they weren't flowers. They were weeds. And she said they looked like flowers to me, Aunt B. And I was wrong. She was right. And I wondered who decided that these flowers were weeds and why were we so ashamed, pulling them up by the roots in hopes that they won't return. You see, there's a lot of flowers labeled as weeds in our world. On April 17, 2013, C.C. Dove, a dandelion, was found pulled by her roots and left to rot. Her, her beauty, a misguided eyesore to those who don't understand, she wasn't a weed. She was a dandelion free to grow and to go wherever she pleased. She was the windborn seeds I made wishes with. As a child, Cece, I have to tell your truth. Cece, a black trans woman. Cece, found noob. Cece, stabbed. Cece, bound by rope to a block of concrete. Her body barely floating in a pond west of Cleveland. Cece, you are a piece of sunshine rooted in soil, trampled and tossed aside because most don't understand your glory. My dandelion, forgive this earth for pushing you away, for not embracing the power of your resilience to stay after being cut down and sprayed with substances to secure your demise. You find a way to break through and rise. You see, no one gloats and gulps 
at the dandelion that grew from concrete. From this moment on, I will pour libations in the presence of dandelions. Water the soil to make sure that those like you continue to grow, flourish, and I will protect you. Blow your seeds as far as the eye can see. Send wishes up to heaven for more sunshine to grow from the ground.
excuses based on difference justified a wrong, what do you think will happen if you thought differently? Will your head explode? Will people stop liking you? Will you start liking yourself? Did you ever love someone in secret because it was too scary to love them publicly? Have you ever feared for your life? Did you wash your hands today? Was that scary for you? Has death ever been as familiar as washing your hands? If color or gender really doesn't matter, how would it feel to wake up the opposite of who you are now? Would, you, would it change your trajectory? Would you do everything in your power to become who you once were? Have you ever felt an aching love? Do you remember what made it stop? Do you keep artifacts of that aching tucked away? Is there a break in case of emergency thing? Do you have things that you break or tear open when you need to feel something, anything at all? When was the last time you were numb? I remember the last time I was numb. Are your fingers still cold from it? Do you own a Snuggie just in case it happens again? Don't you wish Snuggies had a zipper on the back? How did you survive? Did you ever put your tears in escrow? Or post date a night terror for a more convenient time? Have you ever tried to find closure with someone? Was it really finding closure within yourself? Have you ever snuck a goodbye into the casket of someone you loved before it closed? I have. <laughs> Took a minute. I told you that I was rusty. Thank you for being kind. Um, yeah, I don't think that one's in the book, so that was too long to try to remember. Can't remember that one. I'll try it. Oh, okay, we'll see if this one works. Um, this was my two minute poem. Hell, have no fury. Like a woman with a yeasty vagina. <laughs> <laughs> For those who have never felt the devil dancing in Lady Town, imagine, if you will, what it would feel like to smile with pop rocks chased with a shot of tequila. My legs are in the stomach. The doctor comes in, pries my vagina open with two ice cold salad tongs, and then says, I see you're experiencing. 
experiencing some irritation. No shit, Sherlock. She writes me a prescription for Terazol cream. I'm sentenced to three days of injecting my cunt like a cannoli before my man can feast on me without sneezing honey buns and crescent rolls. I am irate and chafed. And everyone seems to want to know how I'm doing, to which I reply, I'm fine, other than this vaginosis causing a forest fire in my crotch. Toilet paper feels like sandpaper, and if my, if my clitoris could grow legs, it would do a double layout from between my thighs, leaving Gabby Douglas with a silver medal wondering what happened. There is no fury, no disdain, no scorn that could capture the discharging pits of hell that I am experiencing. Be afraid, my friend. Be very, very Afraid. <laughs> I love the look of terror from that poem. It's amazing. All right, I think that's all I really have legit have memorized. And so um, this poem is kind of a long one, so I'm going to leave you all with this. Um, I thank you for allowing me some time to come and share, to get my feet back wet, um, and hearing my voice and getting used to this voice and this person. Um, I actually want to, can, can you have me on my phone? I don't want to do the one that's in the book. I want to do the one that's on my phone. Um, and I'll see if I can go ahead and uh, get through it and be done with this. One second. It's technology. Okay, maybe it's one more time. Please. I appreciate your patience. I almost want to sing like the music. We've waited this many years to hear you. We can wait a little longer. True that. True that. Um, So um, when I was, I went to, uh, I had the pleasure of going to Europe for the first time in November. And uh, my last day there, I was assaulted. And this is the story of that, but it was the irony of it was, uh, I had, uh, I've been there 10 days, 11 days. Um, I went uh, from Amsterdam to Paris to, Brussels to Leuven, I spent most of my time in Leuven, and ironically, didn't plan this this way, I was able to go to the European Poetry Slam, Chance mentioned, and watch Final Stage and all of that. I was so inspired, it was great, it was wonderful, it was perfect. I'm walking down the street, I was like, oh, I see why James Baldwin came to Europe to write, like, this is where black poets need to come and be inspired, like, I'm gonna go home and tell my husband, fuck it, let's go, we're out of here. Um, and I walked into a Domino's pizza because I'm like, well, let me find some American shit because I'm hungry and I need something quick and fast. And I walk into uh, uh, getting beat up by a white man, unfortunately. Uh, and so I'm grateful that even in, in the midst of all of that, that I had came off the hills of seeing something so beautiful and so powerful in, in poetry and hearing all of the stories um, on that final stage, I heard people in all different languages tell the stories of being refugees, of dealing with hate crimes, and all the things that have happened, and they find, found their peace and their solace and their healing through these words. And so um, I would be remiss if I didn't honor that experience and be able to do the same. And so um, I think I'm calling this how the story ended, because um, I wrote the entire time I was there. And I can't wait to just be able to share the whole well, I can't share all the stories, but share a lot of the stories. <laughs> <laughs> and so just thank you again for letting me share. There's a thousand ways to begin this story. I walk by strangers and think, can they see I'm a victim? Can they see that part of my joy died in a Domino's pizza? I was out walking fresh off the high of attending the European Poetry Slam Championship. I took advantage of a crisp December night. It felt like the Lower East Side, but calmer and cleaner. I felt 20-something again. Less than 12 hours left in a foreign land, I almost forgot that I was black and woman. 
the most visible form of invisibility, I was hungry. Craving something close to Captain Tony's and Calypso Peach Lemonade, I strolled into an American space, something similar to my home, something quick. I stand in line. I wait. I feel a pizza box ram into my chest. It doesn't budge. I am perplexed. I see eyes that color me confused. I don't move. He is white and short, wearing blue jeans and a black coat. He grabs my forearm. Don't you touch me. The only four words I can utter before feeling fist to face. I don't know how I ended up on the ground face tender. It took 33 years for a man to punch me, to devalue my place in line. I simply wanted a slice, a bevy of cards to wind me down to sleep. Now my body is pounding and shaking and hot and cold and tears roll down my face as I FaceTime my husband, telling him the, my worst, his worst nightmares had been realized. His wife, far from arm's reach, had been violated and he could not keep me. He stood in Cleveland, unable to coddle my frail shell. Before this moment, I thought the worst part of my trip was acquiring two items in blackface. I cried in an antique store seeing a box of infant t-shirts labeled Petite Negro, priced at 70 euros, the logo of black baby being bitten by dogs. And at, my, and at my interest, the sales clerk brings a nutcracker in the shape of a bald-headed black woman, shaped similar to me, body clad with a skirt that barely covered her backside. He yanked her legs open to show where the nuts would fit, and I wept for her. The price tag said 450 euros. She was literally made of ebony and ivory, and I could not leave her there or those babies. I had the capacity to bring them home, to love them. He said the Nutcracker was inspired by either Josephine Baker or Dorothy Dandridge. This reminder to never see myself the way they see me, and here I am sitting on the floor of a Domino's pizza, ass frigid, stockings torn, bruises budding. I reassure my husband that I am safe and okay. We both know I'm lying. I begin recording. The Domino's employees begin consoling. Madame, sit. Madame, drink. Madame, madame, madame. I say no a thousand times, and I wish I knew French to politely tell this nice ass bitch to back the fuck up. I don't want no drinks. I don't want to sit. I don't even know what happened after his fist hit my face. I tell the story to my phone. I tell what I remember. And I turned the camera to the fuck boy who snatched my joy because before this, I reminisced and understood why black American writers came to Europe to write, to see home clearly. Now your cat been made foggy, an opaque reminder that I am still black and woman as fuck. My assailant's excuse? He thought I was Muslim. To which I replied, it doesn't fucking matter what God I serve, because we clearly can't serve the same God. I record and say, and they say, Madame, no, don't. To which I reply, I'm from America. This is how I protect myself. I say my name. I say where I'm from. Imagine me being out here with no receipts. Who gonna believe this imperfect victim? This college student that ain't white or blind or skinny or young. Who gonna validate this truth if I don't? I ask my perpetrator. What type of man would put his hands on a woman and he pounds his chest proudly? He yells the shortest, he yells, the shortest tower of Babel I've ever seen. I speak in simple English. I say, you are nothing. You are dirt. You are less than dirt. You are shit. He yells, you African! He continues to come for me. Had he, been not, had he not been held back, he might have continued to pummel. I smear a smooth fuck you as he makes his final dash towards me. The police arrive seconds after I say it. He is combative with them as well. I probably could have been anyone in his way and the outcome would have been the same, but I ain't anyone. The police neutralize him. I watch his wife well for her husband's safety, but not mine as the officer held their knee on his face. Another officer used a night stick to secure his feet. I never knew that that was the intended purpose. For once in my life, the police were there to rescue me. The memories flood back in. How I turned my back to everyone and reminded myself 
that I am strong and that I can handle this. There was a black couple seemingly on a date with a front row seat to what this man did to me, and they said nothing. Just stared like World Star had been a gift dropped in their lap. The police, unsurprised, said it happens all the time. We talk about basketball as I write for x-rays at the hospital that was four minutes away. I search for anything that doesn't feel like the pain of being pummeled, even if it means talking about the Boston Celtics. They don't tell me to call the embassy. They don't remind me that there's someone advocating for my safety. They probably knew girls like me ain't a priority on anyone's soil. This story is only the beginning. I am outside of my body, as fleeting as a ghost, as steady as an ancestor. My foundation is stable, but my soul is shaking. Black girls stay reframing trauma as gifts, stay rationalizing terrors inflicted, wrapping them in scriptures and jests, because I can only cry or laugh like, who the fuck eats at a Domino's pizza anyway?
Yeah, uh, Barrel House Press, I believe, Barrel, was yeah. selling this. So, uh, they had a small booth, they had a few, uh, a few books. I picked up Daryl Hall as my boyfriend, the book, and uh, decided to go back for the shirt. So, it was well worth it. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm, I've driven up here today from Middletown between Dayton and Cincinnati. Uh, I'm the, <coughs> uh, I've been performing poetry since about 1992 uh, at Poetry Slams. I used to run um, poetry in the southeast in Tennessee. Um, I ran one of the Southern Fried Poetry Slams. Matter of fact, I have a book back there. I wrote the history of Southern Fried, so to speak, at least the 1990s. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> after that, I moved up to Dayton, uh, started the Dayton Poetry Slam. It is still running under Lincoln Schreiber, uh, but I was the founder. Um, ran it for a few years, moved around a little bit, ended up in Middletown. Um, and I'm just finishing my MFA from Miami University, uh, Master of Fine Arts. I got my degree, I've got a degree in poetry now. So, uh, I know, right? So I've got- Paid money to know things. I, I uh, a, a number of the poems that I am reading tonight are from the manuscript of the book that I have put together um, for the MFA program and I'm we're going to be shopping around fairly soon. The book is called My Life and Other Famous Train Wrecks of Ohio. <laughs> cough, right at night in November, cough. <laughs> so we'll start with talking about Ohio. This poem's called Buckeyes. <clears throat> Why is it always Ohio? Why, when big-name producers and directors and writers want a place, is it always Ohio? Lolita? Milk Money? Harper Valley PTA? X-Men Apocalypse? Captain America? Captain Underpants? Heathers? Ready Player One? Ohio? Super 8? Ohio? Serial killers all have to be from somewhere. <laughs> Tourists in your story are from somewhere. Guess where? Wholesome runaways in the big city for the first time in their life. Shit, I can't check that. The mysterious package, where's it from? Characters in your people in space movie have to be from somewhere. Three guesses and the first two don't count. Your less worldly small town characters have to be from somewhere. Why not Ohio? After all, we decide the elections. Ohio has the most addicts. Ohio has really famous serial killers. It mm -hmm. must define the rest of America. <laughs> so if you need a flyover state mention, there's only one flyover state, and it runs from California to New York, and it is Ohio. <laughs> today, a white truck sailed out of the Ohio fog, big black letters across the back proclaiming, white trucks matter. <laughs> Slightly obscured by the high speed flapping of a Confederate flag. The sad cleverness of it made me ache. The dating app profile picture showed a woman I considered attractive, but the edge of the photo declared, I stand for the flag. I swiped. Two days ago, a small group, this is dated now, a small group of white supremacists returned to Charlottesville and threatened to return in force three months after a massive protest left a woman dead after they ran her over with a car. I can't wash all this grit from under my fingernails. So I'm from Middletown now. And uh, this poem is called Middletown, Ohio. <clears throat> this town in the middle, between Cincinnati and Dayton, is unsure if it exists or if it is just 
between. Mm. Heroin, there is hope, billboards, fill whole sections of Vista. The library meeting room is packed one night for the local opiate summit. The bookstore owner complains, here comes the crackhead, I wonder what he'll try to sell me today. The owner has stories of tasers, bicycles, a horse head candle, umbrellas, small statues, odd demands. Workers try to wash away the AK rust from the still meal. Armco running, uh, turning its initials as the major industry shrinks and collapses. The workers settle in and wait for a revitalized town that doesn't happen. The trains rumble through both sides of downtown so extensively that the city built an overpass. Children count train cars from under the eaves of the ever-closed train station flea market. The town expanded, built a mall, watched it crumble. Watch the area grow. Walmart, Meyer, Kroger, Wendy's, Coles, Cracker Barrel, Tire Discounters, El Rancho Grande, Big Boy, Staples, Lowe's, Longhorn, Olive Garden, Sonic, or Charlie's, Golden Corral, GameStop, a few stores went back into the mall. Watch the ambitious politician claim the town in an elegy, nationalizing names like Middle Tucky, while the citizens believe they weren't that definition claiming their own, their own history not carved by poverty, not carved by the small town thinking and conservative lifestyle in a small town area encircled by farm life mixed with suburbs, rent too high for the locals driven up by the Cincinnati commute. Realtors tell you not to buy a house on any street that is a number. Like this one. The recovery underway as the empty buildings start to fill local stores around downtown while the chains still dominate the edges. More sales and service industry replacing the mechanized, laid off, and slim line factories of time's rusted past. The smaller satellite colleges make locals feel a sense of pride to be so educated, but still in such a small town mindset, facing small town problems with such small town politicians and such small town lives as their children escape to somewhere else. Like everywhere else. Like this. Between the cities, drugged up, rust under the nails, town is fighting not to be. <laughs> it could be worse. You could have the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um. <clears throat> okay, so since, the, since my book is called um, Famous Train Wrecks of Ohio, then I had to write some famous train wreck poems. Um, And I'll read two. This one's called The Expansion of the Middle Town. Independence Day, 1910, Middle Town. Central Railroad's 20th Century Limited rerouted onto southwestern Ohio tracks, but a message miss, missed leads to a collision with a freight train in Middle Town, Ohio, the town where I live. If a train leaves a station, at 50 miles per hour and meets an oncoming train trying to get out of the way, when will the two trains meet? Where will the two trains meet? <clears throat> if a body hits a body at speed, metal is like to expand, creating the wreckage and loss that is best accompanied with major or minor catastrophes the world over. Early fireworks, one might say. 20 are killed, among them an unidentified man with WA initials sewn into his clothing, my initials, in the town where I live, just over 100 years later. A strange sort of proof that this town is already hostile to people like me. <laughs> Second poem, uh, we'll, we'll take something a little quick, how it falls. This is called Doodlebug Disaster. On a normal summer day in 1940, Cuyahoga Falls, the Doodlebug, a gas passenger train car, made its regular run on the tracks from Hudson to Akron. Then it slammed a freight train at 40 miles per hour. 350 gallons of gas on the Doodlebug exploded. The burning gas covered the car, all 43 passengers, the tracks, no one survived. The engineer had lost his ability to function clearly because of a buildup of carbon monoxide in the cab. 
The fire was too hot to allow anyone near enough to even try to rescue the passengers for a half hour. 150,000 people came to see. A few tried to help. Most wanted the spectacle. <clears throat> Locals remember it was dinner time. The Cleveland Indians were just finishing a game in overtime. People remember hearing it crash from their front porches. Just another slow summer day in Ohio. <laughs> All right, let's move away from Ohio. <clears throat> I've done enough of that. Um, the book has a lot to do with me post-divorce. Uh, this is called Dating Profile. <clears throat> twice married, twice divorced white guy. Having the kids half the time, I lay in bed at night and wonder if anyone will put up with me again. I read books. I write. I ignore advice. I look through the refrigerator for something to cook. I forget to clean often enough. I don't drink coffee, but I'd watch you if you wanted to drink it across from me. I look out across the lawn and consider the wreckage of these poorer suburbs. Can we meet for lunch sometime? Don't you think we would look good together in a photo? Have I forgotten what it's like to belong? There are dishes in the sink. I should clean the bathroom. The laundry needs my attention again. Someone to blame when it goes wrong. Someone to thank when you get it right. Uh, something a little more slam-ish. Uh, this is called the hero of the story. <clears throat> Don't you wonder if there's more to it than this? Don't you think there is? I drive at high speeds parallel to the oncoming onslaught of traffic inches away and my eye twitches sometimes. And I think not, is this it then? Instead I think, is this all then? We sit here with our acid reflux and our ADHD and our food allergies and our medicine allergies and our MRSA and our social anxiety disorders and our repetitive stress injury as we repetitively stress that we remember more than this as we gulp down a big gulp full of liquid sugar and eat a cheese-coated slab of carbs and then work it off by our denial exercises. No, we're not responsible for that global warming. No, we're not responsible for that economic collapse. No, we're not responsible for that racism, sexism, rape culture, whist whistling void of madness, leading so many of us to gun each other down or run each other down. No, we're definitely not responsible for our kids turning out that way. It's not our fault. It's not our fault. You want to know why we're watching so closely for the zombie invasion? Why we want to catch the comet to heaven? Why we want to fight the demons in the end of the world comic books and perform the greatest deeds in the face of unholy, otherworldly adversity? We believe ourselves the hero of the story, despite the evidence. And I'm right there with you, in the foxholes and the trenches, watching reality TV as if it's reality, drinking the sugar water as if it's nutritious, waiting to be the hero, standing on top of the bodies of the enemy in this Walking Dead series of Hunger Games. And I've been preparing, memorizing the purity, even in the face of moral ambiguity, of the lead character, priming my reflexes on first-person shooters, hoarding as many doomsday supplies as my best intentions can remember. I'll get started next week, I promise. But we're going to need our guns, our caffeine, our Cheetos, and our big girl panties, because we're all meant for more than this silly life of quiet desperation. And if you're not ready to lay down some suppressing fire, then get out of my way while I march asthmatically into the bright, bright future where I finally get the hero, be the hero. That's why I'm here, after all.
If you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. So it said, me. If you friend the abyss on Facebook, the abyss will confirm your friend request. <laughs> the abyss will then check your relationship status, look through your photos, start liking and commenting on photos from four years ago, tag you in its which Buffy character are you surveys, and mention you as often as possible as a link on its wall. If you open a beer and offer the, abyss, offer the abyss a drink, the abyss will have a sip or two. If you're eating chips around the abyss, it will ask if you're going to finish those. If you mention a musician in conversation, the abyss will go by every album by the artist in hopes of understanding you better, of being closer to you. If you tell the abyss where you live, it is in your best interest to look forward to the abyss standing in your front yard with a boombox over its head <laughs> playing that one Peter Gabriel song over and over. If you like the abyss on OkCupid, it will message you and see if you want to meet for coffee somewhere, or maybe an early dinner somewhere, not too fancy. The abyss doesn't want to put you in an awkward financial situation after all. You've just met. The abyss notices that you haven't responded right away, and it doesn't want to come across as clingy or anything, but it is really curious what you want out of this relationship. Your mom called. She talked to the abyss. She thinks she'd make a cute couple.
quartz crystals and other breakable things. In the event of glass, break this emergency wide open and use it to solve the problem. Shattered and broken, this glass has constituted an emergency that can't be solved by traditional methods. The best solution is screaming and throwing things against the wall. <laughs> things like our taps. Then we should drink as much wine as possible until we run out and accuse each other of outmodeling the other. <laughs> Someone should be called self-righteous at least once lest we forget what we're doing. When our eyelids get heavy, when we've overindulged, we should tie these sticks together, make a raft to the mainland, and try to steal it from each other. This may, in fact, include at least one game of musical rafts. One of us is supposed to survive this relationship, after all. Your game may be the most dangerous, but mine involves the most risk and the least return. In the end, if the raft holds together as we both scramble aboard, we'll float to the shore on the other side and start over, resenting each other for surviving as we passionately kiss away all our reservations and declare without a doubt who loved who. Hunter and Prey. My daughter sees and stalks the feral cat who spends hours setting himself in front of the garage. The squirrels, when they have finished stealing from the bird feeder, leave walnut shells on their end. When I pull into my driveway each day, I might see rabbits dash across the field or a family of different cats scatter into the bushes and weeds. A sparrow hawk flew by close enough that I could have reached out and grabbed it. A possum hisses if it even suspects I'm getting too close, then vanishes into the wood pile. A raccoon walks by with barely a second glance, not even caring that I exist. Neighbors talk of coyote sightings, ask if I've seen their dog and posters. The middle-aged man, seeing my daughter playing alone in the park, walks over, sits down, and watches her. When she leaves, he says something she can't hear because she's speed walking to my car, aware of predators. Yeah, <laughs> 
down for it. No, 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 no. You see, you don't get to make history that easily. No, you see, this is what we call a postponement, not a cancellation. And I will be back. See, I'm going to be at the Grand Showcase. And then after that, I'm going to destroy little Josh. And then, <laughs> let's talk to you, Yoli, the so-called Queen of Akron. Yeah, you see, you're not in Akron. You're in Canton, Ohio. And you are here because I allow it. You call yourself Khaleesi? Call yourself Queen? I am Khaleesi. You know, I'm going to be rough. Anyway, our paths will cross. Because as long as you're in my city, you are here because I let you. Well, luckily enough, we also have a... Uh... A uh, new challenger for Mr. J.M. Romig. Oh. Thanks everybody for watching. Okay. Bye.